Well, I am so excited, Worship Tribe, to be joined today by Ellie Mumford, my dear friend Ellie, and um, probably one of the most significant mentors and role models for me as a person, but also as a worship leader. And so I'm excited to talk about worship with Ellie. And just a reminder, if you're joining us for the first time for these conversations, we are talking about what is worship prompted and instigated by this pandemic, which is causing us to ask all kinds of interesting questions mm -hmm. about yeah. to actually worship and can we worship without singing and all these wonderful things. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that Ellie, with with your history with the Vineyard Movement, but also your rich experience in the wider church, I think I am super excited to hear what you have to say to us. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself for people who maybe don't know you yet. Well, thank you. Uh, you're very sweet. You completely threw me off my stride already by being so friendly <laughs> and, so, and so generous. Um, well, as you say, I'm Ellie Mumford. I'm really Eleanor. My poor husband won't call me Ellie. He'll only call me Eleanor. Mm -hmm. And um, John and I have been uh, married for 42 years. We've been in love for 46. And we are very involved with the Vineyard Movement. We started out um, as Anglican clergy oh, 40 years ago over when we were first married. John was a curate in the Church of England. And we absolutely loved it. Wouldn't have changed it for anything had not the Lord intervened rather dramatically, really. So we worked in two Anglican parishes. And then John, through a friendship with a man called David Watson, went out to Anaheim in California, which was a place he'd never even heard of. We didn't even know about California. And we always laughed looking back because he arrived in California in 1982, I think it was, with, um, you know, sort of jacket and tie and leather suitcase and furled umbrella because he didn't know it didn't rain and he didn't know that you didn't dress like that in California. <laughs> and uh, he went to visit this man called John Wimber, whom David Watson had told him about. And I mean, it was so random. It was so bizarre because John is a very ordered and organized person. And suddenly to fly, in fact, he'd been at a conference on the East Coast and to fly west with a telephone number in his pocket. And that was all and turn up at the Anaheim Vineyard, uninvited, was just so out of character. However, as it turned out, it was the Lord's doing, and he had written to say, please may I come, never heard anything back. And when he did arrive in his suit and tie, looking rather odd, not exactly blending with a California background, um, he went to Wimber and he said, look, I'm so embarrassed to be here because I did write to ask if I might, but obviously you didn't get my letter. To which Wimber famously replied, oh yes, we got your letter, John. And we said to ourselves, well, it could be the Lord, and if it is, if he arrives, it will be. Which was so random and so unlike anything we've ever come across. So John relaxed. He spent 10 days there. I was back home. I hadn't gone with him because one of our boys was very tiny. And um, he came back absolutely different different, I mean, profoundly affected by what he had encountered. And the two things that were the most life-changing were his experience of worship and his experience of ministry in the spirit and praying for people and expecting the Lord to make a difference as you prayed. And those were the two things that completely changed his world. And by association and just a week or two behind the curve, as it were, it changed me. And he came home and all he could do was sing these songs. Well, now he would, excuse me for saying, but he's not the world's great singer, but he couldn't stop singing these songs. And the first evening he was back in England, he went down to the village church to do the service in the evening. And I was at home with the baby. And a woman came running up from the church to our house. She said, Eleanor, something's happened. Something's happened. And I thought the place had gone on fire or, you know, it'd fallen down. And she said, John is singing over the church. And I thought, oh no, this is not good. This is not good. However, he had been so overwhelmed by his new experience of the worship of God that he taught them in the little church. He taught them, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. It was so sweet. Mm. and it was for him so life-changing mm. and then of course I was very quick to jump on that particular bandwagon 
And um, that's where it all began, this absolute love of vineyard worship, vineyard songs, vineyard experience, and what happened as you sang them. Mm. It was very, very remarkable to us. So I always thought that you were the first worship leader in the vineyard in the UK, but actually John was. Well, isn't that disconcerting? <laughs> isn't that the funniest thing to think of? But it was so sweet because we realized as we began to move more into this experience with the vineyard, because we were still Anglican clergy, we began to realize, or certainly I did, and John too, we both loved music and we just loved how music and scriptures came together mm -hmm. and worship evolved from that. And I was brought up Presbyterian. I was, and my mother was a Welsh woman whose family had been split down the middle by the Welsh revival. So there was a lot of history there. Yeah. Um, and they were terrified of what happened to me because they thought, oh, she's gone bonkers, like, you know, great aunt so-and-so did. And then um, I loved, my father was a Scotsman. And so we went to Presbyterian church, albeit just outside London. And um, when I was a very little girl, we went to church every Sunday of life, never remember not. And when I was very, very little, we used to sing those beautiful metrical psalms, which were straightforward scriptures, the psalms set to beautiful metric music. And I can remember to this day, I was thinking about this morning, blessed be the everlasting God and Father of our Christ. And we sang it at my mother's funeral, my father's funeral, and in my heart, I still sing it because that was where I learned about worship. And of course, what was so sweet was as a little girl, I would weep through these psalms. And mummy and daddy would think I was bonkers. I mean, they thought I was really losing it at a very early age <laughs> because I was so overwhelmed by this love for the music. Mm. And I suppose it, looking back, it made me realize that that was deep, deep, deep. In, you know, this worship instinct is so deep within you before you even are old enough or have words to explain it. Mm -hmm. So when, and then of course, ever after that, I loved music, I sang in choirs. I, I went, when I was at Cambridge for a little while, I went round Europe with the Cam Cambridge University Musical Society, singing Talis, 40 part mm -hmm. motet, round the cathedrals yeah. of Belgium. I mean, can you believe I would sing in, in choruses and choirs all through my university life? in the chapel at St Andrews and then in the University Singers at Edinburgh and then with Cums in Cambridge because all I wanted to do was to sing. Mm. And I look back now and I realise actually it was worship because Talis's 40-part motet, which is one of the most beautiful pieces of work ever composed, is written in 40 parts in Latin. And I think it's a reflection of the courts of heaven singing these parts to each other across the great, you know, that's where I, that, that's where it was all cooking in me. And then I came across the vineyard and suddenly there was a new way of singing and a new way of expressing and a new way of, of talking about worship and about the intimacy of what this meant. And it didn't have to be in Latin and it didn't have to be Elizabethan. It could be for now. And uh, so even just talking to you makes me remember some of these lovely things. So tell us a bit about your days of, of leading worship. So eventually it went from John singing in the church. In the church. Yes. You, you took a, a lead role. What did that look like? Well, obviously when we were at Anaheim, we were just part of all that they did. And then we came home from Anaheim in 1985. To, um, we went out in 85, we came back in 87. We worked for two years nearly on John Wimber's staff. And that's where everything just grew and grew and grew within us. And there were wonderful times of worship, I remember. And uh, we came back and all we had was, um, there were four of us, John, me, and two little boys. One was six and one was six months. And we came back and we came back with um, an omnichord, uh, which was our worship, worship thing. Because I couldn't play the guitar. I had it all in my heart, but I had no way of doing it. And we knew that you couldn't plant a church without a worship leader. And there were only four of us and the two boys were a bit too small and John couldn't <laughs> sing in tune. So it really was for me to do it. So we, we just made do with what we had, which was this funny little electronic thing, the, the, the Omnicore, which now is people laugh at because it was so quaint and so bizarre. And you would plug it into the wall, turn on the electricity, and then you would 
play it according to the chords and then you would just stroke it. I mean, don't ever even ask Debbie Wright what it was like because she just howls with mirth and mimics mercilessly. But you know, I can only tell you that I did it from seriousness. Mm -hmm. I did it from the heart. I learned very few chords. I could only sing a very few songs. Bryn Howarth, who was a professional musician, was part of our first house, one of our first house groups. And he said, I mean, I would play it with him in the room. Mm -hmm. And he said, the spirit of God always came because he was prepared to use anything. And every time we worship, every time we played, every time we sang in this funny little way, the Spirit of God would visit us and assure us that this was his plan all along. Mm. And however foolish and however humble and however modest and however slightly toothless, the Lord came. And our little church, as it then was, South West London Vineyard, started about two or three months in. The four of us, we worshipped together, the little boys and John and me, for the summer. And then we opened our doors in September and we had nine people come and join us. And we talked and we sang and we played and we worshiped and we prayed for each other. And that's how this began. So it was born from worship. And I think that will be a tremendous encouragement to worship leaders at the moment because mm, yeah. the pandemic and lockdown has yes. been very hard. And we're wondering what very. worship even look like. And maybe we can't have our full band together. Maybe we can't yeah. even sing. But what you're describing reminds us that we don't need all of that, do we? I mean, an omnichord, really? Mm, it is amazing. I know. I know. Well, Maybe there'll be a rush on omnichord sales. <laughs> it's in obviously which case, In which case, I expect a tithe from that. <laughs> no, uh, there was, it was very, I mean, we were very, very limited. Mm. But we, the Spirit of God came. And I was thinking about it this morning, actually, because, of course, very focused on talking with you and how in Revelation it talks about, you know, worshipping in heaven and there'll be thousands upon thousands, 10,000 upon 10,000. And I thought, well, yeah, that's heaven and that will be wonderful. And when we do get together corporately and we do have those wonderful experiences, it's like a sort of foretaste. Mm. But then that wasn't what happened to Paul and Silas when they were in the jail. It wasn't what happened to Paul years chained to a Roman officer. It wasn't what happened to David out on the fields and looking after the sheep. It wasn't what happened to, do you remember that song of Horatio Spafford, It Is Well With My Soul? Mm -hmm. He wrote that on his own, on a ship, sailing over the point of the Atlantic where his wife and his children had gone down. Only his wife was saved with one child. All the rest were drowned. Four children drowned. And Spafford sailed to the point of the Atlantic. And that's where he wrote that song. All on his own. All on his own. There was no worship band. There was no team. There were no thousands upon thousands. But there was a heart of worship. And there was a spirit that longed to get out. And I talked with some friends this, oh, just the other day friends in California and they're like us they're locked down and they can't worship in crowds as they love to do and that's how, that's what we love and I said to her tell me how is it when you can't do this thinking of our conversation mm -hmm. and you know can people worship during lockdown and she said for crying out loud Eleanor of course we can worship in lockdown because worship is the spirit of God fighting to get out Mm. and to tell the Lord how great he is, and to praise him and to worship him, whether we're in tune or whether we're not, whether we're on our own or with our husbands or families. And she said in this case, she and her husband were singing in tongues, shouting in tongues, falling on their knees and praising God all on their own. Because the spirit of God, she said, was fighting to get out. Oh, I and I think that's a sweet way to look at it. What else can you do? The spirit of God fighting to get He's out. Fighting to get out yeah. and worship. That's who we are. I'm getting emotional here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please. Oh, do uh, not get, get emotional. This is so, so that leads us right to the question of what, what even is worship? I know you probably have so much to say on this subject mm -hmm. after many, many years of worship leading and leading church and leading people and... Um, what, what, what would you like to say about what worship is, besides the spirit of God fighting I to get out? I love that. Um, well, again, thinking a little bit, focused on this a little bit in the last day or two. 
If you ask me, what do I think when I think of worship? My first word, my first thought is gratitude. Mm. And I checked with John. I said, what would your first word be? And he said, adoration. Mm. And I think that their partner, I think gratitude leads to adoration. Mm. And I think he's right. I think it is basically adoration. And why do we adore? Because we're so grateful. Mm. I'm just so grateful. And I think that's why I weep when I worship. It's the gratitude thing. You know, that we can worship, that we have everything to be grateful for, that we would be dead in our trespasses and sins without Jesus. I listened to that song this morning, um, I Cast My Mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. And I think that's where this begins. And it's just this incredible gratitude. And I do remember, again, this is all a little bit reminiscent, but this is how it got born in me. Um, when we were in Anaheim working and I went on a women's retreat, perished the thought, but it was great. And, uh, and um, Carol Wimber was there, and Penny Fulton, and all the, you know, all the sort of um, heroines of the faith. And it was wonderful. Um, so anyway, we were at this retreat, and this, they invited the Spirit of God to come, and the Spirit of God came powerfully. And I was overwhelmed, and I was weeping sobbing and I wasn't used to all this stuff you need to remember it was not ever so this was early days and Carol Wimber came wandering past very very sort of just wandering and I remember hearing her and she said to whoever she was with praying she said basically you don't need to do anything with her to me about me she said this is what gratitude looks like mm. and I remember that when I was thinking about worship this is what gratitude looks like. That sometimes there are no words. Sometimes it's too deep for tears because it's just gratitude to God for who he is, what he did, where that puts me, and what I've got to look forward to. You know, it's just, it's a win-win-win, whatever way you look at it. And therefore one's instinct, it's, I think worship is, is a thing of the heart, we know that. It's from the heart, but the, it's in the body that it has to be expressed. Whether it's by tears, whether it's by raised arms, whether it's just quietly, quietly thinking, whether it's just suppressed behind a mask. Mm -hmm. Do you know, I was in somewhere recently and we got to sing behind masks and it was so odd and weird and claustrophobic. But you know, it was still singing. It was still worshiping very, very quietly mm -hmm. and not breaking the rules. And we were being extremely raw abiding because that I think is hugely important that the church should be. This is a time for us to, to work around constraints, not to break through them well, because that is not an honoring thing. Well said. I really do think that. I think we've been limited, we are under constraint, and so are Paul and Silas, frankly. Mm. And just be grateful you haven't got chains around your ankles, because we can still do this stuff. Mm. And, um, but it made me realize we can still worship. We just need to be a little imaginative, a little creative, get over ourselves, get over ourselves, listening to stuff. I was listening to music this morning, and it was just, I was in this room all on my own and the spirit of God just overwhelmed me. It was so sweet. Mm. And I was singing some of the classics, some of the classical things like, what did we, what did I sing this morning? Um, Praise the name of the Lord our God. You know, and that lovely one, I wrote the words down. I wrote it down this morning. You all remember it when I was on the screen. And, and it was that, you know, he bled and died for me. And this is it. This is where our theology, everything we believe, everything we bought into, sets us free to worship. And it says, on the third break of dawn, the son of heaven rose again. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? There's the defiance, okay? Mm -hmm. The angels roar for Christ the King. And there will come a day when we will be with them and we will roar for Christ the King. But at this time, I was just singing very quietly in my room on my own. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. 
for endless days, which are many more than we will live, I will sing your praise, O Lord, O Lord, my God. What else can you do? What else can you say? Endless. And I think I'm very aware of some of the songs at the moment that talk about the endlessness and about eternity. And although this is nothing to do with, maybe it is, John and I have been talking recently about what are we learning through this time? And I think we're learning that as believers and as the church, we're not very good at talking about eternity. We're not very good at talking about death. We've got better at talking about mental health. We've got better at talking about some of the ugly things that people go through. We're not very good at equipping our people to die mm -hmm. because we're all going to die. And some of us sooner than later, and some of us are going to be dancing the courts of heaven and, you know, endless praise sooner than the others. Some of us will be ahead of that curve and we'll be roaring with the angels, mm -hmm. but we're not very good at getting ready for it and preparing for it and teaching people about life and death. Because at the moment people go out and clap for the NHS because that's all they know to clap for. And God bless the NHS and praise God for the mercy, the means of grace that have come to us through medical science, mm -hmm. medical services, doctors and nurses, care workers, frontline teachers, teaching us all those people, I would cover all those bases in my gratitude. But at the end of the day, nobody has answers for death. Death, oh, trampled death, where is your sting? Only the church, only the people of Jesus have that to say. And that's where I think we probably need, as believers and as the church, to step up and teach the people how to embrace all that lies ahead. You know? Okay. Woody Allen said, I, Woody Allen said, I'm not afraid of dying. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Well, gosh, we're all going to be there and we need to. Many thousands of people in this country, millions around the world, many, many times the thousands of our brothers and sisters in the States, they are facing death and bereavement and grief in a way that many of us don't, haven't yet grasped or grappled with. But that's why I think all of this is in the context of worshipping mm. and being deeply, deeply grateful that we have a song to sing, we have a gospel to preach, we have tales to tell of the glory of God. So do you think that it matters what we're singing about in this season? What, what should we be singing about when we're singing? Under <laughs> our masks or... <laughs> no, and well, what that's, that's a fair question. Uh, that's a fair question. I think, I think it's even bigger than this season. I think we should be singing about him. I think we should be singing about the Lord. I think we should be singing our theology. And that's what the vineyard has often done is to sing our theology. And somebody said years and years ago, the vineyard sings as it prays by singing. Those are our prayers. And I think, I think the difficulty in this time is that many of us are really struggling. You know, it's a terribly difficult time. Mm -hmm. People are shut in their rooms. People are separated from their groups. We are community people that we can't be in community. And many, many people are just fainting for want of community and of friendship and of touch. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a touchy people. We're missing all of that. And therefore, there is a proclivity. There could be a tendency to self-absorption and to self, you know, I don't want to say self-pity because that sounds derogatory, but you know, we can be, I can be sorry for myself in this season mm -hmm. because I'm not getting to do what I want to do. And so John and I, basically our responsibilities in the vineyard now are to oversee national leaders in globally. So our job description is traveling. We have had every single trip traveled this year, uh, canceled. Mm -hmm. So we haven't been to Portugal or to Ireland or to America three times or to Canada next week or to Australia for a national conference or to the Himalayas next month. Everything has been canceled. And the level of disappointment and the level of sadness and the level of grief we're all discovered, experiencing, that in itself is an epidemic. Somebody once said, we're living in an epidemic of disappointment, and that's where I live. Yeah. And therefore, I can't afford for that to become my worship. Mm 
Mm. That to become my focus. God, I'm in such a miserable place. This is so awful. I'm so fed up. I'm so this, I'm so that. I can't live there. It kills me. Mm -hmm. But what I can do is listen to my worship and worship for endless days and know the word that God gave me at the beginning of this pandemic, almost every day since, is the Lord is not mocked. I am not mocked. I have not been caught out by this. I have not been wrong-footed by pandemic, by, you know, COVID-19 or whatever. I think that's what the Lord is saying. I almost said, thus says the Lord, but I would never presume to put it quite like that. I'm not quite the Jeremiah figure. <laughs> However, I think this is God's message to me mm. is I am not mocked. Mm. I have not lost the plot. I know exactly what's going on. I know what I am doing with the church. And it's painful. And the church, we the church, are suffering along with all the others of the people around this nation and around the world. This is more global than anything we've lived through because none of, well, very, very few of us in the vineyard world were alive in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. I missed it by a squeak. But basically, I mean, I've heard my parents talk about it. Mm -hmm. But this is the most global thing that has ever happened to us. It's the most global level of awareness or suffering that any of us have ever been through. So my answer to your question of rather a long time ago is I think our worship should be focused on him and on who he is and where he's seated and what he does and what he can do and what he's in control of. And that we need to read the Psalms and we need to realize the anguish that the psalmist went through. But at the end of the day, it was all worship, it was all praise, it was all thanksgiving, despite the ghastliness of some of the circumstances that they lived through, mm -hmm. which is why Psalms are my daily go-to. Got to be. Where else would you go? Do you remember Jesus to the disciples when they were up against it and they went to him and he said, are you going to leave me too? Because people were deserting. Mm -hmm. And they said, Lord, where should we go? Where should we go? You have the words of eternal life. And nothing's changed. Where else should we go? I don't dare go to myself because I'm not to be depended upon. But I know I can go to him because he's safe as houses. And therefore, he's got to be the focus of my worship. And I want more worship songs to come out of this that talk about him than talk about us or about our circumstances. That is so good. That's a good word to us, Ellie. I think I think that's what I think. I'll never forget one time I heard your lovely husband say that a psalm a day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> there you go. I've quoted yes. that many times. And that's true when we are living normal life. But in a pandemic, that's probably doubly true, isn't it? Yes, indeed. It has a particular ring to it. Yes. So it's very good for us. Worship is a very healthy activity. You know, people are talking a lot about the mental health mm. and emotional health and indeed societal health. And I think one of the correctives to all of that is, is to be able to worship. It's very good for us. It's good for our souls. It's good for our bodies. I love that. I, I think one of my worship go-to songs, because we're um, on a farm at the moment, which is not a bad place to be locked down, I have to say, and I'm very, very, very grateful for it. But there are limitations, obviously, in all sorts of different ways. But I can walk out on the fields and I can sing when nobody can hear me, which is merciful for everybody. Because you get out of practice. <laughs> I can't sing like I used to. When I, in a crowd, I can belt it out mm -hmm. and nobody knows. When I'm on my own, I feel much more exposed. It's more difficult to sing on your own, I'm finding. But out on the fields I can. And one of my main songs at the moment has been, um, It Is Well With My Soul. I love that song. Mm -hmm. It is well with my soul. And um, there's a lovely, oh, and of course I won't be able to pick it out now, about my strength being in Jesus alone. Mm -hmm. And by his grace, I am well. I am well. My strength is in my, Jesus, my strength, my rock is him alone. In his strength, I am well. I am strong. I am, you know, in his grace, I am strong. Something like that. It's all grace and strength and wellness of soul. And if Horatio Spaffer could write that in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, then it's probably good enough for many of us under our present circumstances. It is well with our souls. And worship is a reminder of the health of our souls. Mm. 
So good. And so you've talked a bit about singing. What other opportunities do we have when we can't sing or we have to sing quietly? What, what, what else might you want to urge us to think about at this time, Ellie? What opportunities are in front of us that we're, we can get so tunnel visioned on? Yes. Work? That's right. I think that is. And so part of these conversations is just to try and open up and bring in some other ideas. What else could we be thinking about or trying? Well, I suppose it comes um, in two ways. Uh, uh, musically, and of course, you're all worship leaders, so you are by definition musicians. I'm talking to musicians. So obviously our point of reference is music. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, worship is, according to Romans 12, it's with everything that we have. What was it when we used to say work, wallet, something or other, you, everything we are is expressed in our worship. And so there's nothing that we can't do that isn't an expression of our worship. I suppose musically, I would say when we can't sing and indeed we can't play because I've long since my Omnichord has gone to meet its maker. I don't know where it's gone. I can't find it. But anyway, the Omnichord is a thing of the past and I don't play the guitar. So um, I have only got, <laughs> as John has had for years, he just says I, I, play the iPad, iPods, you know, iPod, and um, iPhone, and we have all our music on iPhones. Mm -hmm. And so I would, I would encourage lots of listening and lots of variety. So you don't just have to listen to explicit worship songs. So we, or explicitly vineyard songs. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course we adore them, <laughs> but I go to, you know, I go back to my talus. Mm -hmm. I go back to my Mozart Requiem. I go back to the Missa Solemnis. I, I'm a classical musician originally, and I love all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I go back unapologetically to classical music. John goes back to Gregorian chants. He wow. used a lot of um, sung worship because he came up through an Anglican tradition and he loves all that. And he will listen to the Psalms in Anglican chant form. Mm -hmm. I will listen to metric. I love them, the Scottish ones, you know. So there's all that variety in our musical experience. And there's wonderful music that we've often quoted, you know, the U2s of this world or some other musicians with a, with a you know, a slight sort of um, tendency to things of these the, the spiritual persuasion. There's some beautiful, beautiful music out there. Glorious, glorious contemporary music. And song. I love to listen to songs and to their lyrics. However, that's music. So that's what you can do. You can be listening a lot more. And I'm preaching to the crowd because I need to be listening more than I am. And then what else is there? There's a the recognition that worship isn't just about singing and not just about making music. Of course, the Psalms are full of that. But worship is also um, to, to be and to do and to express the love of God. If it is, like we said earlier, the spirit fighting to get out, the Spirit is fighting to get out and express his love for the world in, in goodness and in kindness and in generosity and in giving and in imagination. And I think in the vineyard, if you'll forgive me using that as the place that I know best, and certainly across the body of Christ, the, the church is well placed to serve and to meet the needs of this moment. Mm -hmm. Because there are things we can do. There are community projects we can be a part of. There are concessions made to compassion ministry. And the vineyard is well placed. Do you remember, um, again, forgive me if I, if I speak to the vineyard at this point, um, Greg Thompson, who's a Presbyterian minister from America, and he came to speak at the National Leaders Conference for us about five years ago. And he was sweet because his experience was all Presbyterian and he loved he didn't, he'd never been to the vineyard before. He knew John and me and he seemingly liked us and trusted us. And so on the back of that, John and Debbie invited him to come. And it was a very, very wonderful, I mean, it was a gamble, but it was a brilliant success because he came and he preached the scriptures like nobody can preach. I mean, it was just fabulous handling of the word, rightly handling the word of truth. However, he also went back to his Presbyterian church in Charlottesville, Virginia, and he said two things. He said, I've not been to the vineyard before, but when I was there, I discovered two things. When they ask for God to come, they expect that he will. Mm. They ask for the presence of God and they expect it, which is, of course, what we do. Mm. And he said, and the other thing I noticed about the vineyard is that they run towards pain. Wow. And 
We can do that, people. We can do that. And we can run towards pain. And we've never experienced a time in our lifetimes where more, more pain is more evident on every side. We can run towards it. And we can run towards it whether it's physical and we can worship God in the way we care for the poor and for the lost and for the broken and the lonely and the homeless and the hungry and the bereaved, everybody who's struggling and suffering. We can run towards that. And if we're stopped from running because of the places that we find ourselves, well, then God has given us in his grace, he's given us medicine, but he's also given us the internet. And I never in a million years thought to hear myself say that. I am so not techie. This stuff terrifies me. But I suddenly realize it's a means of grace, to quote grandma. It's a means of grace because through it we can communicate, through it we can talk, through it we can encourage the brethren. We can encourage one another in our most holy faith. And we need to do that. So I have a list of um, elderly and lonely and wonderful people, mostly ladies, that I telephone regularly. I have them on a sort of, <laughs> like um, on repeat. And I, you know, do maybe one a day and I will telephone these people that I know can't get anywhere or go anywhere or do anything mm -hmm. and are dying on the vine, as we say. Mm -hmm. And, um, but they, we come away from our conversations fortified, fortified. And I spoke with a lady yesterday who's 91 today and I rang her yesterday and talked with her. And... It was just uplifting. It was, and I come away as thrilled as she was. I mean, she was so sweet. She's, I can't tell you who she was, but she's terribly famous. And I just happened to have come across her in London and discovered how terribly old she is. And we've become the sweetest of friends, dear, dear friends. Mm -hmm. And she has all the friends in the world, but she doesn't know Jesus. And this is just my avenue in t telling her, him, her that at this stage in her life, there's a lot to look forward to, you know? It's just, I don't want to be indiscreet, but it's just that we have opportunities, people, yeah. Yeah. to connect with people who don't know Jesus, mm -hmm. to connect with people who do and are heartbroken or downtrodden, mm -hmm. to connect with people if they can just even pick up a phone. You know, there's a phone line being developed through um, uh, Lambeth. It started out with Lambeth and with somebody, a woman, who used to actually be a part of the vineyard and moved to another church since, you know, years ago. She was part of our church, actually, for a long time. A wonderful girl. And she pioneered this phone line called Daily Hope, and then went to Lambeth and got the Archbishop of Canterbury on board, and it has gone everywhere. And it's for older people. I don't know why she told me about it, but it's for older people who can't cope with Zoom. But they can pick up a phone. Oh, wow. And it's called Daily Hope. And you ring up this number, and you get, you have to get somebody to give you the number because you'd have to find it on the internet. However, you get a number and you can ring it every day and you get a Bible and you get verses and you get a little thought and you get a hymn, mm. which for older people is a lifeline. Mm -hmm. It's a technology. It's the means of grace. Mm -hmm. So I just think we need to be imaginative. Mm -hmm. And again, I think in our time, I like to put myself together with you, but our generation increasingly of younger, younger, younger worship leaders right across the whole body of Christ, we have opportunities to be creative and imaginative in ways that people who are more entrenched in their thinking and in their habits might not. Mm. So people, it's time to step up, and be creative, be imaginative. Use what God's given us. Run. And don't, don't focus so much on what we can't do and the constraints. And I read this morning, I was reading Colossians this morning, probably loads of you were, because you'll be doing the Bible in the year, like I am. And um, Paul was in chains, and yet he was sending messages backwards and forwards to people and encouraging them and building them up. And don't take any notice of my chains. This is what I'm saying. He was under severe constraint. It just happens to coincide with our theme. And you know, talk about lessons from lockdown. Mm. Um, he was under an enormous constraint, which is how we got Philippians and Colossians and some of his books. And he might have thought that he was limited in his effectiveness. And look at us today, millions of us reading it. Mm. The Lord is not mocked. 
Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that certainly puts it in perspective. It does. It does. I, I was really moved by that statement to, about running towards pain. Yeah. And you describe, and, uh, what you're describing is running towards people. Yes. Well, exactly. People in pain. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I, just, I love that about you, Ali. You are, that's one of the things I've always admired about oh, you. Oh, that's very sweet. How you always go after people. And um, uh, I, I really think that that piece of running towards pain and the, what did you call it about disappointment? The An epidemic of disappointment. Epidemic of disappointment. Mm. You know, there that's is, a phrase I've caught from somebody else. There is it's an true. opportunity for us there, isn't there, as worshipers there to, yes, there. to run towards that pain in lots yeah. of different creative ways. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And you worship leaders are more used to singing on your own than I am. I'm not very good at it. But you people do, because that's what you do. And, you know, you can be singing in your room and you can be, and even doing it with somebody else. Mm -hmm. and producing new songs and new harmonies just you know do it over an internet with another little group of people and you know somebody said to me from the other side of the world and I for all the world can't remember who it was that that UK blessing thing that we that you people did mm -hmm. has gone worldwide now others have gone there since mm -hmm. but it was a pioneering piece of imaginative creative world and has blessed the body of christ it was somebody in new york i think mm. who had been under severe restrictions living in a tiny tiny little apartment mm. oldish well my generation living with her husband in a tiny 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 little place in a basement in new york and not allowed out they could walk out once a day and she said that she had listened to a song um you'll never walk alone every day and she had listened to the UK blessing and it kept her alive. It kept her going. That's Certainly amazing. alive in her spirit. That's amazing. And we don't And these are worship. We don't even know how many people are listening or encouraged oh. or find the strength to get out of bed in the morning because Exactly. Um, yeah. Because and that's what she said every morning. It gave her strength. Mm, that's amazing. It's, it's so sweet. Mm. And I think we have to hold on to those big stories and the big horizons mm -hmm. rather than just the limitations of our room and our croaky voices and you know get together with other worship leaders that's what's so sweet about this is that you are a community mm -hmm. and worship leaders can be a community and they can be an online community and they can be a backwards and forwards just through a one-on-one -on -one like you and I've been this morning harmony which is a joy and you know this is uplifting Mm. And this is in microcosm, what could be happening all around the vineyard community at this time. That's right, Ellie. And on that note, I would love for you to pray for us and oh, um, encourage us in that way. And, and I don't know about you, but I'm definitely learning to think about time and when we pray in a very different way at the minute. You mm. know, you'll pray right now. We'll release mm. this in a couple of weeks time. And somebody will watch it a year from now, <laughs> and yes. your prayer will be exactly what they need to hear. Isn't that sweet? Astounding, isn't it? So, um, I, that's, I that's what we asking do. people to pray because we need it. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. I want to also thank you for your faithfulness. I know you're talking about a croaky voice and all <laughs> of the omnicord, yeah. but really, you and John have forged a path for us in the UK and Ireland to do the things that we are called to do and worship mm. and be the, the people that we're called to, de to be. And I'm just extremely grateful. Um, we, we, um, we do owe a lot to you and John. So um, I would love for you to pray for us and um, just to receive a, another blessing for our tribe from you. And mm. Love to, honored, Thanks. honored. I would love to. And as I pray, and I'm thrilled to do so, I've, got one little thing to tell you about one quotation that I discovered when I was just thinking about us talking together like this this morning and it's a quotation from um, Archbishop William Temple who was an Archbishop of Canterbury after the war I think but it is a beautiful beautiful definition of worship and I want to leave it with you like a sort of party bag if you like of sweetness and it says this he wrote this to worship 
is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, and to open the heart to the love of God and devote the will to the purpose of God. And in my little margin, I have written here, it covers the bases. He's talking about our consciences and our minds and our, our imaginations, our hearts and our wills, and that worship would consume them all. So Lord, I ask you in this moment, in this moment, wherever my brothers and sisters in Christ should find themselves, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would come in some mysterious powerful way you would come you are not confined by the constraints that we find ourselves in you are not mocked by the circumstances that we're having to go through you have not lost the plot you are not out of control you've not taken your eye off the ball you are where you always were you are seated on the throne you are in absolute control you are the sovereign god heaven and earth you sit on the throne of heaven, but earth is your footstool. You rule over all things, and yet you are intimately caring and concerned for what is happening in the lives and the hearts and the consciences and the minds and the wills of every man and woman listening to this in this moment, whenever that moment should fall. So Holy Spirit, would you come? Would you quicken our hearts? Would you steady our nerves? Would you strengthen our wills? Would you bring health to our bodies and health to our souls as we learn to worship you imaginatively, creatively, freshly, newly? And Lord, I thank you for the gifts of creativity and imagination that you have dispersed throughout the vineyard world and way, way beyond it through this precious, precious gift that you revealed and entrusted to us all what? 40 years ago when this all began. And Lord, we thank you for that sacred trust that you've invested in us as your people, as your worship leaders. Like Frodo carrying the ring, like an Olympic torchbearer carrying the flame, you've entrusted us with a treasure and with a flame that is the heart of worship. And our instinct is to love you and to worship you and to express it with our bodies and our souls. And so, Lord, I pray in this moment that you would steady the nerve of your people, strengthen and bless them. Anything that God has ever given me, I bless you with it. And I pray that in the blessing of it, it may multiply hundredfold, a thousandfold across the movement, across the body of Christ, across the world, in its need and its desperation, crying out, crying out for the presence of God to be made manifest. And God is still saying that it is through the church that his manifold wisdom and wonderfulness would be made known. And Lord, in our day, in our time, in our generation, would that be, would that be? And the people of God, wherever they are, they say, Amen and Amen. And even Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Indeed. That was, Amen. I feel so boosted and encouraged speaking to you. And I know others will feel the same listening to you, Ellie. Thank you so much for your You're faith. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. You have forged a path for the way that you're always encouraging us mm -hmm. worship leaders. There's so many worship leaders in the vineyard. Yeah, there are. You are one of you, their chief encouragers and you've always mm. been championing worship and we're so thankful for that um and thank you for taking very welcome to talk to me today really Thanks. appreciate it bye-bye